we lose track of where they are. There's computers in our cars. Um, there's computers in our phones. There's computers in our washing machines. Um, I knew I was in trouble when I got my first fridge that had a computer in it. Um, and the problem was the computer and I disagreed on what the fridge should do, and the computer won. Um, so you know, it's the beginning of the end. Uh, so you can get computers in toasters. And I love this one because this one's actually a few years old. But um, someone programmed up their toaster so that it would connect to the internet, get the weather forecast. And then it would stamp a picture on your toast to tell you what the weather forecast would be. So if it was going to be rainy, your toast would pop up with a little cloud. And I, I thought this was great because I'm the sort of person who's not organised enough in the morning to actually check what the weather is. So I go out with an umbrella, and it's a beautiful day. So then the next day, you know, I, I go out in a bathing suit, and it's pouring rain or snowing. So I, this sort of technology is is um, is great. And uh, that last thing in the corner. Um, I'll, I'll explain what that's supposed to be later. So I'm going to stop now, um, and I'm going to step back, and I'm going to go to a reference book, uh, which is getting started with the Internet of Things. And I'm going to tell you some of the things I learned from this book. So if your background is in the programming of PCs or even more powerful computers, a fair warning. Embedded programming for low-cost devices means working with very limited resources. This is in shocking contrast with the World Wide Web. So everyone, close your eyes now. Where technologies usually seem to be created with the utmost inefficiency as the goal. Embedded programming requires more careful consideration of how resources are used than what's needed for PCs or servers.、Um, so there, there's a rule of public speaking which says. Don't just stand and read from the slides. And I've been going for three slides, and I've just been stood reading from the slides.、Um, so some of you may be thinking, "Well, gosh, there's lots of other good talks on, and they're in French, unlike this one.、Uh, so why am I here when I could be in one of the other talks?" But don't worry, because I am actually going to add value to what's what's in that book.、Um, and the reason, whoops. <laughs> Let me carry on.、Uh, embedded platforms only provide small subsets of the functionality of their larger cousins, which may require some inventiveness and work where a desired feature is not available directly.、Um, I will just digress a bit. I once saw feedback on a speaker who wasn't me,、um, and they said the speaker seemed genuinely surprised by each of their slides. Um, and again, this is you know this is the second rule. So the first rule is don't read from your slides, and the second rule is don't be surprised by your slides.、Um, and I've just failed both rules, but we'll carry on, and I, I will add value, I promise. So, getting started with the Internet of Things, very good book, available from O'Reilly. You can buy it on Amazon, and it was published in June 2011, not that long ago, maybe two years ago. Whoops. So June 2011. That means that now this book is completely incorrect. And this goes back to what I was saying about Thomas Watson. He said something in 1943, and it was right for 10 years. So the author of this book said something in June 2011, and it's already wrong. So what's changed? Well, he was talking about programming on an Arduino. Um, on a net, do we know? So it's a. You can see that there's a picture of it on the left. It's a little board. It's got an Ethernet connection. It's got various little chips that do things.、Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit different. It's a Raspberry Pi.、Um, so the main difference you can see between these two is、uh, the one on the left was drawn by a professional artist. The one on the right was drawn by me.、Uh, there is a skill difference.、Um, But other than that, there's not actually that much difference between these two devices. They look kind of the same.、Um, the Raspberry Pi is a little bit bigger; it's a little bit heavier,、um, but you know they're pretty comparable. So, what has changed between 2010 and 2012? What's really changed is the application servers. In 2010, an application server was a big thing.、Uh, In 2012, an application server is a pretty small thing,、um, and what that means is that you can take this application server that in 
it was inconceivable to run that on an embedded device. In 2012, 2013, we can just do it. One of the other things I、um, sometimes talk about, and in fact I've even written a book about it, is OSGI.、Um, so I just want to stop now. That that little logo, you may not. Do any of you recognise it? I've probably just given it away.、Uh, now. I'd been working on OSGI for quite a long time before I learned to recognise that logo as well. That's the OSGI logo, and OSGI is absolutely what's enabled this change in the application servers.、Um, so OSGI gives you—it was designed originally for embedded systems, and it gives the ability to take parts of the system out to put it back, and it gives you this dynamism and this flexibility. That if you're going to make an application server that can squeeze in into, into an embedded device, that that's what you need. So, why has this change happened?、Um, why weren't these really big application servers big enough or good enough? And in the in the years going up to 2010, what seemed to be happening was that every year the application server was bigger than the last year. We added new features. We added new programming models, and the application server was getting bigger and bigger. And we thought about it, and we thought, well, these really big application servers, with lots and lots of features, they're good for lots of things. For for your data center, it's great.、Uh, you're not going to be starting and stopping the server many times a day, because if you do that in your data center, something's gone quite wrong with your data center. You know, you're not going to be trying to squeeze it on a Raspberry Pi or anything like that because you're running in a data center.、Um, but data centers were not the only people or the only use cases for application servers,、um, and so this is where we come back to my artistic abilities again, or the, the lack of my artistic abilities. I've given this talk a few times, and every time I've invited the audience to guess what I'm trying to draw. Never once has anyone in the audience worked it out.、Um, so I, I live in hope that you guys will be the first to figure out what I'm trying to draw here. So, what's it good for? Yeah, getting getting very close. Yeah, yep.、Yeah. So this is, this is promising. No, but what I'm trying and failing to draw here is a developer,、um, and so a developer they've, they've got coffee because everyone knows a developer is a machine for turning caffeine into code,、um, and they've got coffee in particular because it's Java.、Um, they have a MacBook because, well, I'm looking around and I can see I think I can only see one laptop open and it's a Mac and mine's a Mac. So, out of a sample of two. 100% Mac usage in the developer community,、um, and the other thing about developers, of course, is that we all have deadlines, and we have deadlines that are a lot tighter than we want. So you know we're coding away and we're really happy, and then we look at the clock and we go,、ah! "It was supposed to be delivered yesterday." <laughs>、um, so when we have these deadlines, we don't have time to be doing things like deploying to the application server. Starting the application server, waiting some time for the application server to start, while we go get coffee, and then coming back—that that's not good enough for our our cycles.、Um, and again, it, if you're like me, the way I develop is I write something and I'm really pleased, and I deploy it to the server and I start the server, and it doesn't do what I thought it did. So I fix it. I realize what a stupid mistake I made. I deploy it to the server. I start it. And it doesn't do what I thought it did. So I fix it, going da da da. Deploy it to the server, and it doesn't do what I started, thought it did.、Um, so I go through that cycle about ten times a minute, really. I, my my development cycle is try it out, fail, try it out, fail. And so when you're programming like that, if you're not the sort of person who plans everything out in advance and gets it perfect, you can't be stopping and stopping and stopping and starting the server because again, you don't meet your deadline. So, what do developers need in an application server? 
Well, it's got to be an easy install. We're developers. We're not system administrators. You know, we're not in the business of doing these really complicated installs. The server's got to start really fast. Deploying an application to it has to be easy.、Um, I think again in the data centers or these kind of environments, what you want is you want a really controlled deployment to the server. You don't want anybody to be able to just come in and go, yeah, run that, 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 that.、Um, you want someone to manage it. But when we're developing, we want to be able to go run that, 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 that.、Uh, you know, because it, it's not a production system; it's just our little development system.、Um, one of the other things about the The configuration is, you know, it's not my job to configure application servers. I don't want to be spending a lot of time. I want it to go out of the box, up it comes.、Um, and one of the other things that I think works really well is that if I let my colleague configure the server, that's even better than me configuring the server. So if they can do the configuration, check it into source control, all I do is extract the configuration, and it all works.、Um, I think one of the last things that developers need in an application server,、um, and this is traditionally an area where IBM hasn't done so well, I don't think, is cool T-shirts. So everyone knows that you know developers turn code into caffeine while wearing cool T-shirts.、Um, we've got an IBM booth today,、um, and we're giving away cupcakes, which is cool, but we're not giving away T-shirts. So apologies in advance,、um, but. Okay, I work for IBM. I think even without the T-shirts, except for the T-shirt that I'm wearing,、um, I think we now do have something that is really cool for developers. So this is another art challenge. I think this one's slightly easier. So yeah, exactly.、Um, so it happens that the requirements of the cloud are pretty similar to the requirements of developers. So what you need for the cloud is you need two things. You need density, and you need elasticity. So, what do I mean by this? Well, density means it has to have a small memory footprint. You want to fit a lot of these things into your cloud. So, you can't have big servers. You need little servers. Elasticity means that if you actually need a big server, you need to be able to turn your small server into a big server. And then turn it back again. So you need to have a small footprint that, if needed, can become a big footprint. And then, when you change your mind, the footprint becomes small again.、Um, and the way you achieve that is that you can ena you enable and disable function. So if you're not using a programming model, you don't want it in your memory footprint because you're paying for that footprint. When you change your mind and you decide that you did actually want JSF and JPA. You want to be able to add JSF and JPA easily without having to do a whole massive redeployment.、Um, I think we used to be content with configuring these things statically. Now we want to do it dynamically. You know, you want to be able to say, "Server, let's have JPA," and you've got it. And again, it's got to be an easy install because in the cloud you're installing hundreds of these things, so each install can't be painful. And the other thing about the cloud is that it needs to have an easy uninstall as well. So you know you scale your system up for Cyber Monday, and you've got hundreds of servers, and then you realise no one's buying your stuff anymore. So you take away those servers. You've got to be able to get rid of them. In the ideal case, of course, if everything goes well, you never do the uninstall. You just your customer base grows and grows and grows and grows. But you know we all know even when things are doing well. The demand is dynamic; it does fluctuate. So I've, I've talked about two things. I've talked about how what developers need, and I've talked about what the cloud needs. And it's really quite cool that these two things happen to align really well. So, is a small server good for anything else? Well, yeah, actually, I think it is.、Um, so the, the other two things I've talked about: the developers and the cloud. That's facts.、Um, that's where the industry is now. What I'm going to talk about now is the future,、um, and it's also my interpretation of the future. And I don't work for Gartner.、Uh, 
Um, I don't have a crystal ball, so this is my guess. I think I'm right. I could actually be totally wrong. Um, so I, I wouldn't, you know, go tell everyone that this is how it works today.、Um, but I talked about ubiquitous computing. You know, we've got these computers in cars, computers in fridges, computers in toasters. At the moment, these computers are pretty small computers. They're they're running that restricted programming model when I. That I talked about when I was reading from the Internet of Things, they're, you know, they're not running a full application server. They're not, you know, doing anything. It's it's usually, you know, just a tiny little minimal thing that can fit on a chip that can fit in a fridge. Well, I think in the future, whoops, there we go. In the future, in my vision of the future. Everything's going to be running WebSphere, so there's going to be WebSphere in the fridge, WebSphere in the washing machine, WebSphere in the toaster, WebSphere on the phone, and、um, WebSphere in the car. So, again, this is one of those things that you know, ten years ago, if you'd said that to people, they would have thought you were absolutely crazy,、um, and now they only think I'm slightly crazy. So, I figure in a few years. So. We've seen, you know, even just not within our lifetime, but within the last few years, we've seen so many changes in how we use computers, and we've seen so many changes in the world and how the world operates and how everything is connected to everything. And we do all these things now in terms of, you know, we're on the on the metro and we've got our phone and we're checking Twitter.、Um, I was looking at car brochures the other day, and the car had two options. The first was that I could, for 80 pounds, I could get internet access in the car. So it meant that I could be sat in the car and I could connect to the car, and it could act, you know, it could give me internet access. The other thing I could do is, for a similar amount of money, I could get it so that while I was driving, the car would give me Twitter updates, it would give me Facebook updates, it would allow me to tweet while I was driving. Now. I'm not sure this is a good idea. I think, in fact, this is a crazy idea, and that there are some things that are best done without the internet, and driving is one of them. But again, you know, maybe this is just because I'm old, and actually, in five years, I'll be there in my car, going, "How did I ever drive without tweeting?" So, we shall see.、Um, if I never come back, it may be because I was tweeting while driving, and then I died in a horrible car crash. But Hopefully not. How many are having just said that tweeting while driving is a really bad idea? Do any of you have <laughs> one person in the audience? <laughs> any any others who tweet while?、Well, okay, I'm old. I'm behind the times. I,、um, but when when we've been talking about all these technologies and the, the tweeting while driving and and all that kind of thing, tweeting on the train,、um, we've Talked about mobile. The, the mobile bit is the client. So we have a server that's in a data center somewhere. You know, the the Twitter server,、um, and then our clients connect to it. And the clients, it's sort of, it's one of these things that looks kind of weird to put on a slide because it's so obvious. The client is mobile. The server is not mobile, because obviously servers aren't mobile. Servers are big things. Why would you carry a server around? When you can just leave it somewhere. Well, that's the old new world. In the new new world, I think servers are going to be lightweight enough that actually the servers can be mobile too. And when I say lightweight, I mean sort of two ways. I mean lightweight in the way we talk about software, but I also mean lightweight in the sense that you know it, it doesn't weigh much. So we've been talking again in the last few years. There's this, been this trend of location-based services, and you know the, the server figures out where you are, and then it gives you information which is appropriate. So it says, "Here are restaurants near you. Here are people near you." I think we may see in the future locatable services instead. So instead of Google telling you, "Here's a restaurant near you," Google is actually near you as well, or or some other server is near you, and you can connect to that server. That's near you,、um, and so this brings me back to 
to the Liberty profile.、Um, I do work on Liberty as my day job,、um, but I'm not here to sell Liberty.、Um, partly because I wouldn't make very much money because Liberty is free for developers, and I think you're all developers.、Um, but I do just want to say a little bit about it. So it's free for developers. There's free tools too, which are very good. And the thing about Liberty, which is the reason I'm talking about it in this context, is it's so lightweight.、Um, so it's a 50 megabyte download. So、uh, we've started giving it away on USB keys. And I thought, oh wow, that's really cool. That shows how lightweight it was. And then I realised that actually a USB key is like several gigabytes, so it's not really that impressive to fit it on a, a USB key.、Um, but still, you can you can fit it on a USB key.、Um, but it's also it's really lightweight when it's running as well. So to run a typical JEE app, that you know a fairly big one, not just Hello World, it takes about a 60 megabyte memory footprint. So the the Raspberry Pi. It has 512 meg of memory, so that means you can fit. Well, you could fit several web server servers on the Raspberry Pi if you wanted to.、Um, I don't think that's the recommended way of doing it at all, but you could do it.、Um, and again, the server starts in under five seconds. So compared to these old servers that took a long time, the Liberty it does just start.、Um, and the reason it's able to do these things and have the fast startup and have that. That small footprint is it's modular and it's dynamic, and it's again it's it's OSGI that enables that.、Um, so I, I used to demo Liberty, and I'd I'd show how fast it started, but then I realised it was a bit sad because you don't actually ever really need to restart the server because it is dynamic. You change the config file, and it picks it up. So there's this five second restart that we never use because we're never restarting the server. And so th this is again, you know, what makes that possible. And in particular, you know, there are other servers. So you know, if you've got Tomcat or something like that, it's pretty small. But Tomcat doesn't have JPA. You know, it doesn't have all these other features. And it, in its smallest mode, neither does Liberty. So it's just got a little kernel.、Um, <clears throat> but then you can add features. So if you add all of those. You've got stuff like JAXRS, so you can do the RESTful web services. You've got JPA, you've got CDI, you've got transactions.、Um, I think if you added all that, you might find that running it on a Raspberry Pi it starts to struggle a little bit.、Um, but you probably wouldn't add all those. You choose which ones you want. So you'd start with the kernel, and you'd say, actually, today I just want Servlet and JSP. Or actually, I don't even want JSP. I think that was a bad idea. Let's just have Servlet. So you can add things and you can take things away. <clears throat> Say I'm so sold on OSGI that I actually want to use OSGI in my applications as well as on the server. You can add、um, WABs, which is like WARS but for OSGI.、Um, then you want to access a database, so you add JPA. Then you change your mind about the OSGI again. You take that away. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my colleagues and I,、um, in particular my colleague Tom, who's out on the booth. Um, he's a little bit crazy, and so we've gone a bit mad. What, you know, once we got the Liberty server and we saw how small it was, we realised all these things that we could do with it.、Um, so this this is another experiment in art.、Um, so I, I drew this, and I was so pleased with myself, and I thought, oh, it's such a funny picture. And I showed it to everyone, and I said, do you see do you see what I was trying to do? And they went, no. Um, so what, I, what I'm trying to draw here is a tablet,、um, and so I thought about it. It probably makes even less sense in French than in English,、um, but you shouldn't feel like you're missing out since no native English speakers got it either. Because a tablet, the word is kind of like a table. So I drew it so it looked sort of, you know, like a mobile phone, and it's got the icons, but then it's got little feet as well because it's like a, yeah. <laughs> I keep explaining it.、Um, um, so that, you know, running on a tablet—that's maybe not too surprising because the, the tablets, the modern tablets, they're they're pretty powerful.、Um, but we can do better than that as well. So it can run on an Android phone.、Um, and the first time I saw that, I was just like, "Wow, that's so cool! It's got an application server and it's running on a phone."、Um, and then the second time I saw it, I thought, "Wow, that's so cool!"、Um, and actually. I still see it, and I go, "Wow, that's so cool!"、Uh, 
Um, but it's even better than running on an Android phone, because um, Tom, he did this on his personal phone. And so he sort of thought about it, and he thought, you know, I like IBM, they're a good employer. Do I want to sacrifice my brand new Android phone <coughs> to IBM? No. I'm going to use my old, cast-off, three-year-old Android phone. Um, so this phone's you know, way less powerful than a modern phone, and it can still run the application server. Um, and then the, the final thing is it can go on the Raspberry Pi, and that's what I'm going to be showing off today. Or, well, I'm going to be trying to demo it today. Um, so how many of you have heard of the Raspberry Pi? Yeah, I think it's been such a runaway success. Um, I don't think they realized when they started it how popular it would be. Um, and I think the main reason it's been so successful is it's so cheap. It's 25 euros. Um, and again, you know, a few years ago, if we thought, yeah, you could get a computer that could do not everything, but it can do quite a lot of stuff. It can you know, run Linux. And it costs 25 euros, and it's 1.6 ounces. Um, and, you know, it's got 256 meg of RAM. The, the new ones have 512 meg of RAM, but I think the 256 number is actually more impressive because it shows how much you can do with kind of limited resources. Um, and the way... It, it doesn't have a hard disk, instead it's just got a little SD disk. So, that's all good. Um, but I promised you a hat. Um, so the first thing is, where is the hat? And the next thing is, why, going back to this idea of mobile servers, why would you do that? Why isn't a data center good enough for a server? Why do you need to get hats involved? Well, we take the internet completely for granted now, I think. We, everywhere we go, we assume that we're going to have internet. Um, and then you go to a conference. And then you realize that the conference Wi-Fi doesn't work. And then you realize that this assumption that you were always going to have internet, it wasn't right. Um, and there's other environments where, again, you, you don't have internet. Uh, and one thing is that some things you can do fine without internet. Collaboration is not one of them. So what, one scenario I was thinking about is if you have a disaster recovery team, and you know, there's been an earthquake or a flood or something like that, when they go out to, to wherever, they're not going to have internet because there's no infrastructure, because that's why they're there. There's been a disaster. But the, the disaster, that doesn't mean that the disaster recovery team don't need to collaborate with each other. You know, they maybe need a ticketing system, so they say, OK, I've brought sleeping bags to this place, or, you know, OK, let's go to you know, tents to the north. Uh, <clears throat> And so, if everyone's phone is disconnected, you know, they can't collaborate with each other in that way. So what you want is you want a server that you can take with you. And it provides a little micro-network that's just available for you know, the, the disaster workers. And they can collaborate with each other, they can have their ticketing system in an environment where there's not the infrastructure. <clears throat> and one of the other... <coughs> excuse me. One of the other scenarios I thought about was um, <clears throat> I work in a really distributed team. So we've got you know, colleagues in Toronto, colleagues in China, colleagues all across the world. And we've got a shared mailing list. And every now and then, I get an email that says, there's cookies in the kitchen. And I think, oh yes, cookies. And then I realize it was sent by someone in Toronto. And it just, it makes me so sad. And for that kind of case, I wish, again, that we had sort of a more geographically specific server, so that when you have cookies for people in Toronto, the mail only goes to people in Toronto, that it's, it goes to the Toronto server. Um, probably we could do such a thing, you know, with our big network. Um, but there's other things that are really specific to a location, so I don't know, do you guys have the Red Bull car here? No. Do you guys have Red Bull here? OK, cool. So Red Bull, what they have, it's absolutely brilliant marketing. They've got this car, and they've sort of, they took a beetle, 
and they strapped this enormous can of Red Bull to the top of it, and then they painted the car, and the Red Bull car drives around, and you know that if you're near the Red Bull car, you can go and get a can of Red Bull. Well, I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, what if Red Bull didn't just want to give you a can of Coke? What if they wanted to connect with you in a deeper way as well? They wanted you to go to their server. They wanted you to, you know, interact with them in some way. Well, they can't guarantee that you know you're going to have network. But if they provide network on the Red Bull car, then you know that if you see the Red Bull SSID, you can connect to the Red Bull car, enter in your information, and get a can of Red Bull. Um, and so that's sort of the model that I had in mind for my demo, but without the Red Bull.、Um, and then, then I realised a few things,、um, but I'll, I'll come to those in a moment. So what I've got here is I've got my Raspberry Pi. So Raspberry Pi, and there's a few other parts to the demo that I want to show you.、Um, you can see that this is a very highly professional demo、um, because I have a really. What I have here. Have any of you heard of Tinkerforge? Tinkerforge. It's really cool. I think it's a really good companion to the Raspberry Pi.、Um, And the idea is to allow you to play with physical computing. So if, if you're not there with your soldering iron and, and you know hooking all the pins together, but you still want to see what you can do,、um, Tinkerforge gives you these little pre-packaged bits.、Um, so I have a little bit of Tinkerforge here, and that's just a controller.、Um, and then the really important bit is this bit here. I don't know.、Um, And that's a little temperature sensor. As、so、I've got that all connected to the Pi,、uh, and it connects by USB. And the USB cable I have is a very long USB cable,、um, and I have not succeeded in getting a short USB cable. So this sock here is not doing anything except for holding the USB cable.、Um, and you know, when I first did this demo, I, I thought I was going to. Make something really polished and professional, and I was going to sew pockets into the hat that would hold the various bits.、Um, and then it was 11 o'clock the night before I was going to do the demo, and I ran out of time. And I thought, what can I do to hold the bits? And I found a sock,、um, and so I've been using the sock ever since. I I came on the Eurostar yesterday, and so me and my six computers went through the security scanner. And the security scanner looked at my six computers, looked at me, and I had to unpack my whole bag. And so I got to this, and I can't tell you how embarrassing it is to have a Raspberry Pi, a temperature sensor, and a sock as you're trying to go through security.、Um, and somehow I had to disassemble the whole thing. And I thought I'm never going to even get it back working by tomorrow.、Um, And then somehow, in disassembling it, everything is safety pinned to the hat, which is why it's sort of stuck together. I, I took out all the safety pins, and the sock dropped on the floor, and I didn't realize it. So someone else had to come up to me and say, "Here is your sock." <laughs> <laughs> so my, my top tip is: should you wish to try wearable computing, the Internet of Things, if you go through security, don't use socks because it's, it's just not worth it. But so. Um, the other thing I've got is I've got my wife. My、um, I've got two things.、Um, so the Raspberry Pi it doesn't come with anything. It doesn't come with power. It doesn't come with Wi-Fi. It doesn't come with all these things.、Um, so I've hooked it up. This is actually、um, intended to charge phones. So it's a battery,、um, but it works quite well for the well. It works sort of well for the Pi,、uh, and it works sort of well for the Pi.、Uh, and I've also got a Wi-Fi dongle. So. If I go to the web, and I click on that, and I wait, and I wait, this is the point at which I start to panic and I start pinging the Pi. <laughs> so. I have given this demo many times, and when I first started doing it, I thought about you know this model of the portable server, and I thought I'm going to have the Wi-Fi, and I'm going to have the、um, the battery, and then it means that I can. 
put the Raspberry Pi on my head and I can walk around.、Um, I think I tweeted earlier and I said the Wi-Fi is working,、um, and I knew the Wi-Fi wouldn't be working by now. Before this demo, the Wi-Fi was working,、um, but you know the Raspberry Pi does lots of things really, really well. At the moment, Wi-Fi is not one of them. So, I have my backup Ethernet cable. I'm going to connect that, and let's see. Okay, so hooray! So you can see I've got the temperature sensor, and it's saying that the temperature is 24 degrees. So no one's wearing the hat. Cafe Waz is now closed.、Um, so if I now try and put the hat on my head, I am.、Um, I always wonder whether I should do demos when I speak because they never work.、Um, but then I realise that for the audience. That's actually the fun part of the talk: is watching the speaker be humiliated as their demo doesn't work. <laughs>、um, so I keep doing them. I, I keep trying.、Um, and with this demo, it's even better for the audience because there's sort of this double humiliation, right? So the first is that my demo hasn't worked already. The second is that I'm about to put a hat with a Raspberry Pi on my head. I'm going to look like such an idiot.、Um, And again, you know, I do this, and I look up, and I see just this wall of mobile phones in front of me as everyone takes photos. <laughs> so, my mother's seen the photos.、Um, so, let me take the hat, and you can see that you know the hat would look pretty stupid no matter what. But now it's got a bright orange Ethernet cable、um, and a battery cable sticking out of it.、Uh, I should also thank Antonio as well because、um, there's quite a lot of moving parts to this demo. Which makes it even more scary to give.、Um, and I arrived this morning, and I made sure I had everything, and I did, until I got to the Ethernet cable. And then I realised I had no Ethernet cable.、Um, and as you'll see, a Raspberry Pi without an Ethernet cable is pretty useless because the Wi-Fi doesn't work. So I had to borrow an Ethernet cable.、Um, and I think, oh, da. <laughs> See, that's not not working even by Ethernet. Is it? Okay. So. Okay, so oh how sad.、Um, all is not lost, though,、um, because one of the things I learned about the Raspberry Pi is, as I said, the Wi-Fi doesn't work.、Um, I once I was giving the demo, and I don't know if you can see it. It's just a normal five-volt phone charger, the connection, and the power cable worked its way loose as I was putting the hat on my head, because of course, if you're trying to put a hat on your head, you know it's jostling around. So I stood there, and I had this Raspberry Pi, and I couldn't figure out why it didn't work. And then it was only after the demo I looked at it, and I realised—I、um, don't know if you can see—there's little lights. Those lights were not there.、Um, so again, now I have no idea why it's not working.、Um, but I'm just going to stop with that Pi. And one of the cool things about the Pi is that it's cheap. So it's 25 euros. So what I have here is I have my failover Pi. So I'm going to disconnect from this Pi.、Um, the failover Pi, unfortunately, it doesn't have the temperature sensor because the temperature sensor is actually more expensive than the Raspberry Pi.、Um, <laughs> but you can hopefully still see、um, my Pi's also all have the same IP address because、uh, I once got someone gave me some Pi's and they were、um, DHCP and I hadn't realised. So. The, the Raspberry Pi.、Um, you can see it's also connected to power because I only have one battery. But I can still I can put the Raspberry Pi on my head, and now yeah, phones everywhere. <laughs> you can see I've got an application server on my head.
Um, so, again, you can see when I first wrote this demo, I had this really great idea, and you know, this is a bit like telling you about the cookies in Toronto. I had this great idea that everyone in the audience would have mobile phones. They'd connect to the ad hoc Wi-Fi network, um, and so if I put in, I'm Holly, and I'm sitting at the front. And then I submit. <laughs> Leaving that aside, the, <laughs> the idea was that people in the audience they could connect to the ad hoc Wi-Fi network. Um, that server, it's not just running a. Well, at the moment, it's not running anything. Um, but if it was actually running, it's running JPA as well. So it's. Takes the um, the information you put in, it, it persists it to a database, and then I can see the list of everyone in the audience who connected to the ad hoc Wi-Fi network and was able to put in a request to say, "Oh, I'd like a Mars bar." And then I was going to take my hat, which wasn't connected to my computer by Ethernet and wasn't plugged in, and I was going to run around the room and give out the um, the candy. Um, but don't worry, you're not missing anything because I've never actually had the demo get remotely that far. So. Going back to my slides for the moment, can we do better? I've, I've learned some things about the Raspberry Pi. So the cool thing about it is that it's really cheap. It's 25 euros, which means you can have the failover Pi. The bad thing about it, it's not very reliable. I've discovered. I think for some things, if you use it for home automation and you just leave it plugged in, it's great. If you try and put it on your head, it's not so good. I think, to be fair to the Raspberry Pi Foundation, putting it on heads wasn't the use case. They originally had in mind,、um, but I looked at this thing here with its battery and its Wi-Fi dongle, and I thought, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to have something that has Wi-Fi and a battery and is portable, and I haven't done a very good job. So, what am I actually trying to do? I'm trying to have something that's like a phone.、Um, so this phone here,、um, it was actually acting as the、um, The access provider for the Wi-Fi that both my computer and the Raspberry Pi were not connected to.、Um, so the phone has got a built-in battery、uh, that doesn't come loose mid-demo. It's got built-in Wi-Fi. The built-in Wi-Fi doesn't die mid-demo.、Um, and it, it also, that, you know, one of the problems with the Raspberry Pi is I initially thought it would act as the access provider for the Wi-Fi network, and then I realised it doesn't even have enough physical electrical power. To connect to a Wi-Fi network, much less actually host one. But the problem with phones, and what I've discovered, is that phones are expensive.、Um, so this is an old slide, but I wanted to leave it in.、Uh, I went to JFocus in Stockholm. So I was in Stockholm. My colleague Tom, and this is his phone. He was in London doing another event. We only had one phone, so I couldn't show the phone. Whereas we had enough Raspberry Pis that we could show the Pis. Um, today we're both in Paris,、uh, so I can show the phone. So,、uh, what I've got here,、uh, what I've got here, is I don't know if this is going to work very well.、Uh, I've got, I've got iMovie, and the reason I use iMovie is so that I can try and show the screen, and it's not mirror image.、Um, Because some of the others, it's a mirror image.、Uh, but what it means is that when I try and position the phone in front of the screen, I move it the wrong way. But let me just quickly show. So this is the phone. It's rooted. It's running Ubuntu.、Uh, so there we are. And so if I type in, I do bin slash server run.、Uh, And I do enter. You can see. Let me get this straight. Right.、Um, can you guys read that? Sort of. I can even. I can barely read it, and I'm right in front of the computer.、Um, so you can see. Ah, it, you can see. I have launched the default server, which is not the server I intended to launch.、Uh, so let me try and cancel out. <coughs> So I've cancelled that. Oops. 
and, uh, oh, and I've just started the default server again. Uh, so I think the, uh, the keyboard on these is a bit special when you want to do things like control C. Um, so I think I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, but you can see that there's the console that's showing that it is actually running WebSphere on the phone, uh, which is quite cool. So I've got a slide saying that actually what I want to do is ask a question instead. Um, so we've got some Raspberry Pis to give away on the, um, on the IBM booth, and I've got one here and a case. Uh, so I have a quiz to see if you've been paying attention. Uh, and so my question is, uh, what's the download size? Oh, oh dear, oh this is, oh dear. <laughs> okay, I, see I optimistically assumed that only one of you would be paying attention and it would be easy. Um, gosh. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, let's see what... <laughs> no, that's really paying attention. Um, okay, so if I try the footprint size of the JEE app, 60, oh, oh dear, okay. Um, 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 um. Okay, I'm just, oh. I'll leave it there. If you come talk to us on the booth, we'll come up with a, um, with a, que a question that uh, fewer of you know the answer to. Um, so one, one thing I also wanted to say as well um, is we do have a boff tonight on the booth. Um, so it's Captain Dash, um, who are a startup, um, and they're doing some quite cool things with dashboards and big data. Um, and so we're, we're hosting them on, on the booth tonight. Uh, so do come by and have a look at that. Um, but that's all I've got time for. So thank you very much, everybody. Um,